Well, good afternoon and welcome to our second event, which is called Tackling Air Pollution. Uh, is it a direct route to freedom or a roadblock on liberty? Um, I'm Katie Gillett and I'm the Clean Air Programme Manager at the Conservative Environment Network. And just in case you haven't heard of us, we're the independent forum for conservatives in the UK and overseas who support net zero nature restoration and resource security. Um, I'm just going to give you a quick background to this conversation um, and then we can get a, a hearing from the panellists. So, of course, many of you will know air pollution is a very live topic at the moment. Um, it remains the leading threat to human, environmental threat to human health, but how we reduce our exposure is more of a contentious conversation. I'm hoping the next, in the next hour we'll be able to cover this um, and see, see, how, uh, see where we go. Um, um, so one of the kind of the topics I want to cover is how we can preserve things like individual choice and cleaner forms of uh, active travel, um, and, and if clean air zones aren't the answer, then what is? Um, before we get into the discussion, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Healthy Air Coalition, and Henry Gregg, who's representing them today. And I'd also like to thank our other panelists, David Simmons, who's a member of the Sen Caucus, Councillor Emma Marshall, Imo Martino, and Matt Lesh. Um, I'm going to go to each of the panellists to hear their thoughts and then I'll put a couple of questions to them before going out to you in the audience. And if you'd like to tweet along, our Twitter handle is at sen underscore HQ. Um, just a tiny bit of housekeeping. We want to get as much into this uh, panel as, mu uh, um, as possible, so I'm hoping that the, the panellists will keep their rem opening remarks to three minutes. And if you in the audience have a question, um, one of my colleagues will bring you the microphone, but if you could keep it to a question rather than a statement. Um, and so with that, we're going to go to our first panellist, which is David Simmons, who's been the MP for Ryslip, Northwood and Pinner since 2019, and he's a member of the SEN Parliamentary Caucus. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed, Katie, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I said my name is David Simmons. I was one of the architects of the recent Uxbridge by-election campaign. And the issue of the ULES was clearly going to be one of the things on which we fought that campaign right from the start. But a lot of the media coverage that says this shows a significant uh, U-turn from the Conservative Party has rather lost a lot of the local context. So both Steve Tuckwell, the new MP, and I spent many years together as councillors in Hillingdon. We were in the habit of judicially reviewing governments, both Conservative and Labour, over the failure over many years to adhere to air quality standards in respect of emissions at Heathrow, which is the only part of the whole of the Hillingdon Borough that's ever exceeded the ULES air quality standard on a consistent basis. And it showed for us that the most important thing is to be saying to people, we're against policies like the ULES, which the Mayor's own report says makes little or no difference to air quality in outer London, and we are in favour of policies that help to tackle the sources of air pollution in a given location. And for me, there's an important theme which runs into the reason why I'm so motivated to be part of SEN. And that's because this is a group which helps our party talk about how we approach the environment in a way that is meaningful. That when we talk about some of the, the targets, some of the issues around climate change, I know from constituents that can feel quite abstract. And bringing that down to the practical steps that people can take in their lives, in their choices as consumers, and that happen in their community is incredibly important. And I felt it was a real positive that the Prime Minister made the speech recently when he talked about looking in a more practical and fundamental way about how we deliver the aspiration which we still have to hit net zero, recognising that in outer London, 57% of low-income households have a car and rely upon it. So what works in the centre doesn't work in the suburbs. That in the countryside, people, including my in-laws, rely upon oil-fired boilers and oil tanks because there is simply no access to mains heating. And that's not something which is going to be changed quickly. And the dependency that people have on vehicles outside of the very hearts of many of our big cities, where most of our people live outside of the hearts of those big cities, is an incredibly important direction for the party. So the shift to saying, let's begin to look at how we can support people to live positive lifestyles, to use these things that have supported freedom and autonomy and liberty, but to do it in an environmentally friendly way. That, to me, is fundamentally conservative and, in my view, also a politically astute move. Thank you, da Ooh, thank you David. Um, and the next, we're going to go to Emma Marshall, who's a, a SEN councillor and a, she's a clean air champion and she's a councillor in Worcestershire and Redditch Borough Council. 
Um, I'm always conscious in conversations about air pollution, actually, that we talk about sort of community consent and sort of localism. So I'd be really interested to hear your views as a councillor and how we can kind of embed those sort of thoughts into policy. Thank you. So national policy, which is obviously our IMPs and David's roles, uh, ultimately they do come down to the local councils and then your local councillors, like myself, it's then our job to Oops, implement sorry. it. Sorry, can you hear me? Perfect. Um, so it's vital that we roll out these schemes by thinking about yourselves. We've got to make sure we have the community's buy-in because you're the ones at the end of the day it's going to affect. We have seen where these schemes are, uh, are announced without good community buy-in and uh, Oxford and the 15 minute cities are a great example of how council communication with the community can cause issues and it can effectively derail an entire concept which otherwise would have, would have been fantastic, I think. So 15 to 20 minute cities, they are essentially a planning uh, tool which allow you to uh, plan your doctor surgeries, your dentists, your shops within a short 15 minute walk away. Um, the moment you start putting permits and restrictions on people's movements, however, you're going to lose the public's favour. I'd say now that 15 minute cities are actually now toxic when you talk to people, um, the members of the public. And I think it's a brave councillor who decides to try and talk about it and say, we're going to do this in our area now. So in Redditch, for example, we promoted having play parks within just a 15 minute walk, but because of the Oxford 15 minutes story, which blew up, our residents were really suspicious about what we were trying to do. Um, so if we are trying to ask people to now leave their cars behind, we must look at solutions which are reliable, efficient, affordable and safe. And I must say, based off that recent interview we saw, to say that residents in deprived areas don't drive is, is ridiculous. Um, I cover two areas of deprivation as a county councillor and one of the biggest issues in my inbox is about parking. So I can confirm to you all that towns and rural areas are very different to cities. So what solutions are we looking at in these areas? Well, in Worcestershire, we have been trialling a demand responsive transport solution for the past 12 months. The results so far are really promising. Um, we've seen increase in passenger numbers in the area trialled, and actually we, we could probably put on another bus, we're, we're oversubscribed. This has now led to us putting on our second trial in a very rural area so we can see how this works in, in this space. So demand responsive transport isn't anything new, uh, but there have been vast improvements in technology which now allows this to be a more viable solution. I'm really excited to see how trials progress um, and then we can be able we will be able to discuss this much more. In my opinion, we have to move away from subsidising empty buses that are just chugging around town spewing out um, pollution. They're, they're not actually serving anybody and they're frankly a waste of taxpayers' money. So I think that demand responsive transport is one of the solutions we need to be looking at closely to how we solve the public transport issue. Um, there's actually so much more I could say about air quality, but I have only got three minutes. Uh, one last thing, though. I don't think your councils can forget about putting trees next to roads. They are one of our biggest allies in mopping up the, air poll the, the, the pollution coming out on our roads. And also, they, they help to keep our roads cool when we have heat waves. So with that, I'll, I'll hand back. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. It's always really interesting to sort of hear... Um, what comes comes goes through your councillors' inboxes when we're thinking about these sorts of policies. Um, next, I'm going to go to Imo, and Imo is the head of the UK portfolio at the Clean Air Fund. But she's here today to talk about the work of uh, the work that Stonehaven's been doing on a new campaign called Refresh Britain. And Refresh Britain is looking to shift the policy perception of air quality to see be seen as radical to popular. I think this is really interesting, given a lot of the conversation since the Oxbridge by-election. And uh, do you think that it's possible to shift the pos uh, air pollution debate into a more positive space? 
And do you think that we can design policies that sort of uh, seem to work better with public opinion? The short answer is yes and yes. <laughs> um, Katie, I'm very worried that this is going to be a really boring panel because I'm about to agree with the two previous speakers. So um, we're going to need to kind of create some, some disagreement here somewhere. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Imo. I'm from the Clean Air Fund, as Katie mentioned. We're an international um, NGO, a funder working uh, to combat air pollution in a set number of geographies. Um, but one of those is the UK, and that's where... Um, my work is is taking place. Um, and as Katie mentioned, I want to talk to you today about a piece of work we've been working on for two years now. And the reason it directly relates to um, what we've heard from David and Emma is that we've been asking British voters in target constituencies what they actually think about air pollution and what kind of policies they would like to see to combat air pollution. And that has allowed us to develop a series of policies which we've then tested with focus groups to give us some real insight as to what where people are at. And we knew that people found uh, some of the sort of clean air zones unfair for a number of reasons. And what people really want are policies that aren't restrictive, that don't put too much pressure on the individual, that deliver systemic change and better approaches to clean air. But the most crucial thing in the research is that what we discovered is that the health messaging around clean air gets you a chunk of the audience and they're really engaged and really committed and deeply concerned, but you get an additional chunk if you also talk about clean air in terms of community and the benefits it will bring to your local area. And so we've got evidence that there are votes in selling the arguments around clean air where it is framed as part of improving your local area. So the policies that we've come up through Refresh Britain, and I think you have this beautiful flyer on your chairs. If you don't, we'll be handing that at the door. Um, but the policies that we're looking at are kind of designed to improve your local town by making more green spaces and creating places that people can be proud to live in. Better streets by getting rid of the most polluting vehicles through scrappage schemes. And better transport systems by having greener, cleaner, more reliable, better transport systems, particularly in areas where you've got high air pollution and an under-representation, um, well, just insufficient um, public transport. And then there's also a scheme for homes, so looking at investing in insulation to make homes better equipped, keep them warmer in winter and reduce emissions from our homes. So we really encourage you to uh, go to the website, sign up, get more information. We are launching officially on the 16th of October so this is a sneak preview of what there is um, coming up but um, I think what we're we very much designed this to address the concerns that have been raised already and to make sure that we have clean air policies that don't just deliver improvements in air quality they also deliver better happier places in which people live and work. I think it's always really interesting when you work on clean air how a lot of the conversation has been quite negative. So I think it's really nice that there's sort of like a very positive story to tell about what uh, cleaner neighbourhoods can actually look like. Um, next, we're going to go to Matt Lesh, who is the Director of Policy and Communications at the IEA. Um, Matt, I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on the polluter pays principle. Um, and I suppose as we're kind of looking at solutions to clean air, um, sort of what 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 alternatives do you think there are to sort of using private vehicles for short and medium term journeys? And do you think that some of the technological solutions around like e mobility are sort of part of the part of the solution? Well, um, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to the discussion as we go on. Um, what I'd like to quickly do is discuss where, where I, what I think the, the problem is, or some interrelated problems, in fact, how I think we can think about this from a kind of market-based framework, and then talk a little bit about a kind of market solution. Um, I mean, so already, obviously, I don't need to tell Sen that um, pollution uh, and cars produce a huge negative environmental impact on people's lives. As someone who uh, has asthma, I, I feel that very personally. Um, but not at the same time, I think the environmental part is only the first part of it. I think there are another three issues you can think about here. Um, one is the, the kind of social cost when it comes to congestion. There is um, 
probably one of the biggest costs of road use is the, is the fact that we all get stuck time and time again when, when you end up in a car. Um, it costs the UK economy something like £6.9 billion a year, or an average of £900 per motorist. So congestion is, is an absolute disaster. Add on top of that the cost of people not being able to live near where they could be most productive. Um, we also have an upcoming fiscal issue here when it comes to thinking about tax and cars, which is, of course, that as Treasury collects something like £40 billion a year from fuel duty and vehicle excise that aren't applied um, to electric vehicles. There's a, there's a bit of a disproportionate um, tax implication here. <clears throat> Finally, that we also know that there's a political issue here, which, you know, shorthand for is that by-election here, but the practical truth that the vast majority of people use cars um, to drive to work, school, visit family, whatever else that, that may be. So how do, we, how do we square all those different things off? Well, I, I like to think about these things through how we can most effectively unleash market forces to achieve our, our positive environmental lens or market environmentalist approach. In the first instance, as you've kind of hinted at, there is this question about innovation. It's the fact that cars are way more efficient than they were in the past. There's something like um, a, a car in motion today is probably polluting less than it would have been idling uh, 50 years ago. And that's because of all sorts of extraordinary um, technological innovation. We also have things like um, e-bikes, we have e-scooters, which I'm personally a fan of, much lower emissions, electric vehicles as well, of course, that produce no emissions. So that's that's the first instance of it, which is enable markets to function efficiently, let people ride e-scooters if they want to, um, don't continue banning them because of historical laws. Um, at the same time, though, I think there's also a role, on the other hand, for thinking about how you address pollution <coughs> through um, things that we know very well, which is the price mechanism. So I always think back to Joseph Stiglitz's quote, which is, not paying the cost of damage to the environment is a subsidy. If we, if we don't charge people for the cost of their environmental damage, we're subsidizing them and they're hurting society in the process. That's the story about negative externalities. Um, so then what can we do about this, trying to square all these different things together? So in an, an ideal type world, and I'm a think tanker here, I'm not um, uh, trying to provide a, a politically um, immediately um, positive solution here, but I think there is a way to square them and square all those different interests, which would be to have a pro-environment and pro-motorist road tax system. Um, you could have a road tax system that charges people not a flat rate like ULES, um, which often punishes people who aren't making much of an environmental impact, as has been said. But you could, you could do something more proportionate to the amount of environmental contribution, their contribution to congestion, um, and therefore it could be cheaper at some times of the day, more expensive other times of the day um, to, to deal with that, also proportionate to their CO2 and, and local um, air pollution cost. Um, this, this could be proven an extremely effective way to basically speed up our roads, make our roads far more efficient in that respect. It could be combined with some other pro-motorist policies, maybe reducing the frequency of, of MOTs for newer cars. Um, it, something that is probably going to have to be done in some form sooner or later because fuel tax money is disappearing. Um, it shouldn't be an additional tax. It shouldn't be the, the, the perception issue and the truth issue with ULEZ is it's singing motorists with a new tax for little environmental gain. What we need to do is a, a kind of replacement tax for fuel duty. And ideally, that would be a road pricing system that takes account of all these things. Um, it, it could also be a story about levelling up because inevitably um, road taxes would be less because there's less congestion in, in um, uh, outside of London and, and the southeast, so the proportionality would be much better. Um, it would also ensure that people who have electric vehicles are paying a greater contribution to the cost of their use of the road and their the road maintenance costs from electric vehicles, which they don't currently pay uh, to the same extent if you're not paying fuel duty. So there's a whole bunch of, I think, pro-motorist, um, uh, kind of conservative pro-environment ways to think about uh, an alternative system uh, of... of um, dealing with both congestion and pollution. Thing I know that um, the road pricing stuff is uh, like a really interesting thing coming up, but as always, I always think it's good to remember just how much congestion sort of costs, not just in time but in money um, as well, which I think is a really good thing to talk, uh, to talk about. So we'll come back to that. And finally, I thought we'd go to um, Henry Gregg, who's the Director of External Affairs at Asthma and Lung UK. Um, I think for me, uh, as, as I learn more about air pollution, one of the things that sort of surprises me is about you know where you find hotspots and what's causing them. So what do you think of the, like in the last you know the last I don't know some, last while have been the most uh, the best policies sort of bring our air pollution exposure down. Sure, thank you, Katie. Um, so for those who don't know, Asthma and Lung UK we're the UK's lung charity. We represent the one in five people 
who will get a lung condition in their lifetime. Uh, but we also host the Secretariat of the Healthy Air Coalition that brings together 20 health, environment and transport organisations to campaign for clean air. Um, I'll get onto your question in a sec, but just to talk about some of the health impacts of um, air pollution, we know that it contributes to 43,000 deaths. Um, and in fact, it really um, creates misery for people who have lung conditions uh, in many cases. 60% of the people that we hear from who have lung conditions say air, condi um, air pollution makes them breathless. 43% says it, it can trigger exacerbations which end in hospitalization and can in extreme circumstances end in death. Um, but it also has a, 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 a real impact on children as well because their lungs are, are forming. Um, and so that, and it can also. There's also increasing evidence that it can impact on on un, unborn children as well. Um, in fact, the um, the ten percent poorest in society are seven times more likely to die from a lung condition. Um, so it's 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 having a, a, a real impact on people across the country. And in terms of hot, hot spots, um, actually, it's not just densely populated cities. There's 16 areas in the UK um, that had an illegal level of nitrogen dioxide in 2019, and that's. And when you're looking at some of the hotspots for air pollution, Manchester is one where we are now, um, but also places like Dorset, Essex, uh, Norwich, so places that you might not might not expect. And in terms of in terms of what works, um, I mean, there's a range of different contributors to air pollution, but 62% of the harmful emissions are from road transport. So that's one of the major. Um, uh, focuses we do look at agriculture and heavy industry as well in the Healthy Air Coalition, but we're looking at what can we do to really um, reduce that those emissions from road transport. Um, so, for example, the clean air zones um, in Glasgow, Bath, Bristol, Bradford, and London. Bradford earlier this week announced uh, 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 there was some some statistics released that showed that their air pollution was the lowest since records began as a result of their clean air zone. So it is having an impact, but we do recognise that actually you need a whole range of policies. Um, you need to invest in transport, as Imo has said. Um, you need to make it easier for people to, 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 to switch where they can. But we want to see the government really funding cl cleaner, cleaner transport solutions to really make it a, a, vi a viable proposition for people. And I guess I would, I would just end with, with this challenge that the, the problem with air pollution in, in terms of getting people on board is that they can't always see it. But if you had... If you were getting a glass of water from your tap and you knew that there are pollutants in there that you couldn't see and they were going to make you ill, would people accept that? I don't think they would. So if they don't accept it for a glass of water, why would they accept breathing it in when they walk down the street? And I think that's why we need to work together to make the air cleaner and make sure that everyone can breathe more easily. Oh, that's a really, really uh, interesting analogy, actually. Um, I think I'll go to some questions. I'll put, pose a couple of questions. So then if you and the audience want to get some ready while we hear the answers for the first couple. I think one of the things that kind of stood out to me was on messaging, particularly around uh, following the ULES expansion. Um, you know, a lot of it is like we all accept that congestion is bad for air quality. It's not very enjoyable to spend time sat in traffic. But do you think that, it, that, that it, this is all a messaging problem? Or do you think that... Um, or, do you, or what, what, what sort of things do you think we could do to take the political heat out of the topic? I think I'll go to you first, David. Well, it's clearly something where <clears throat> we do want a lot of political heat about it. I know, as we just heard from Henry, uh, and speaking as a, as a fellow asthmatic, you know, there are a lot of people who want to see this issue dealt with effectively. But for me, I think the starting point should be the um, good old 1995 Environment Act, which meant that councillors here like Oliver and Warren and others who are from local government have a legal duty enshrined in law around air quality and environmental pollution. And air quality tends to be something that is very, very local. I gave the Hellingdon example that it's Heathrow Airport and the roads immediately around it that are the areas where the air quality monitoring shows a breach of the ULES. In my constituency, where I've got over 80 farms, substantial areas of Greenbelt, there are no areas at all that are consistently above the ULES, and yet it's still been imposed on people that live there. I think the way forward is to find that route, as, as Emma described, to gaining community consent. And that is about recognising that a standardised approach doesn't work. We need to make sure that local authorities are free to implement solutions that are relevant to the local area. For example, in Hillingdon, we pressed for uh, better powers to deal with vehicle idling outside schools. So we know we've got a lot of areas where, particularly both delivery vehicles and parents, and I see them when I take my kids to school, park for half an hour with a diesel engine running all the windows of the car opening, having a cigarette. And you think, 
you're wasting your own money, you're polluting the air, you're causing a problem. And yet we are not able to deal effectively with that. And at the same time, that person who is dependent upon an older vehicle to access life-saving cancer treatment at a hospital in my constituency is being charged £12.50 a time. Now, to me, that is not fair. And I think most voters look at it and say, this is not fair. And not only is it not fair, it's not reducing air pollution effectively either. And that's where the things like, firstly, the, the incredible work that's been done across the transport industry to decarbonise and depollute our transport networks, which has got much, much better over the last few decades. And the kinds of things that Emma described around tree planting, around greening areas to act as effective sponges to soak up some of that air, air pollution that we see. And then some of those longer term things that the government is investing in to do with decarbonising the energy network, a greater investment in nuclear, and fingers crossed if it works, carbon capture and storage, that will be transformational in the way that we think about this in terms of climate change. So it feels to me like we have to have that, that local strategy that maintains local consent, that shows people how this is relevant to them, combined with that longer term approach, which we've already seen around vehicles and we know can work, that's around decarbonising and depolluting and de-risking our national energy infrastructure. That's a really interesting response. I wonder, Imo, if you want to come in also about the messaging side and talk a bit about the community thing that we kind of used covered in your Refresh Britain sort of explanation. Uh, yes, I mean, we we commissioned a piece of work uh, this year from the Centre for Policy Studies and looking at some clean air policies. And they had a whole chapter in there, the title of which was Comms, Comms, Comms. It is absolutely crucial that we get the communications right. As Henry says, there's quite low levels of awareness of air pollution because it is the invisible killer. But what we do know is that the public does support action on net zero and does want to live healthier lifestyles and does want policies that improve their local communities. And so what we need to sell in are policies that are designed with the audience in mind and that take account of the things that they're interested in and that have as much carrot as they have stick. I think one of the challenges of some of the existing policies is that they are seen as punitive, they're seen as unfair, and they are seen as more stick and, and banning things and not uh, prohibiting people, constraining them. If we have policies that give people more of what they actually want, then there's going to be a political reward for politicians who introduce those policies. So I absolutely <coughs> believe that communications is and messaging is crucial but it's not about going out with more of the same messages around the health impacts of air pollution it is about understanding where your audience is what works based on evidence and then linking those messages to clear clear policies that deliver what people want yeah that's really interesting and i actually thought i'd come to you emma on this about community consent because it's come up a little bit this week um in terms of 15 minute cities I always think that, you know, uh, the first after the Emergency Active Travel rollout, we spoke a lot about community consent, what that meant, and how you kind of ask communities about what they want. I always wonder, though, but what, what is community consent and, you know, how, how can we sort of measure it? How can we make sure that it's done properly? Uh, what can councillors do who, I guess, are on the f front line of this, you know, do to sort of consult their communities? Because I think it's quite an obscure uh sort of ask sometimes yeah it's it's an interesting one because the the tr traditional way of getting community sent is you send out a survey please fill this in and do you like it don't you like it the problem with that is you're only going to get people respond when they don't like it so you end up with skewed figures anyway so actually what you need is rather than just consultations you need engagement that's a bit more hard work it means getting your officers from the council it means getting your councillors actually out there in a room like this, talking to people and listening. Politicians are really good at making a lot of noise. We're, we're famous for it. But we actually have to make sure we're also listening too. And simply putting a survey in front of somebody and going, well, leading question, what do you think? Let's make sure we are opening that up much wider. So when we are listening to people, we're getting, it's, it's that qualitative versus quantitative, isn't it? Let's get that quality feedback. Yes, it's hard work, but that's, that's what we signed up for anyway as, as councillors. Um, we want that hard work, I suppose. We thrive off it. <laughs> Yeah, and I also thought I'd come to you, Matt, actually, about this, because you're talking a little bit about road pricing. Um, you know, it, 
it would be wrong it would be naive to assume that it wouldn't be come with its challenges but what do you think do you think are the lessons from previous clean air zones including ULES what do you think are the lessons if we wanted to do something like that yeah, I mean, I think that the first lesson is, lesson is probably loss aversion, which is you, you can't sell something to people on negative terms. I think that you need to show a benefit to them of whatever policy you're talking about. That's kind of my first thought. My second thought is um, you do have to be frank and honest uh, with people about whatever trade-off you're making and don't try to obfuscate um, because people will read into it and the conspiracy theories will form and um, all sorts of terrible things will happen. And when it comes to road pricing, that does seem to be quite a clear message to me, which is half an hour extra a day to see your kids. I mean, it, reducing congestion, reducing environmental impact, but that half an hour extra a day you get to spend with your kids not sitting in traffic feels like something that um, is such a powerful potential message. Um, obviously, it would require a very effective communicator and a very, I think, carefully designed road pricing scheme to avoid um, the kind of backlash that you might see if it was inappropriately handled. And we've already seen some of um, discussion around uh, kind of post ULES <coughs> road policies. It's interesting. I always think it's. I read recently that you know on the uh, in the summer holidays, um, the average commute goes down by fifteen minutes, um, but the average school journey is one point six miles, which is obviously quite well suited to not just everyone getting in a, a private car mm. um, every single day doing the same route to, to work or to school. Um, I think the last question I had before we go out to you in the audience is to Henry and sort of sort of talking about whether we think the national conversation around air pollution has become a little bit too city focused. And, you know, when we when campaigners are thinking about air pollution, like how can we kind of overcome these challenges that people have been like, oh, well, it doesn't these the same principles don't apply in suburban or rural areas. I thought you were going to ask me what's more toxic, the, the conversation <laughs> or the air. Um, yeah, I think I think that is right. I mean, I think that it inevitably has become a, a, a conversation that's that's centered around cities. But actually, going back to the previous question, I think part of that is because people don't get can't get consistent information about what the air pollution is like in their area. We take thirty thousand calls on our on our helpline every year, and a lot of them are people saying, "I don't know what what the air pollution is like, but I feel like when I go out, it's really bad, and I need to have that information for my health." And it's interesting you talk about um, uh, maybe that's in places like Heathrow. I don't know, but it, if you talk about people with, with with asthma, most people have got most children have a, someone in the class who has asthma, and when you start to relate it to to their experiences, then I think it becomes more more kind of grounded for them. But I, I definitely I definitely think it's not just an urban problem. But in, and there are hot spots outside of those places. If you're near a big road, it can be rural, but you, you might actually have quite bad air pollution. And people don't realise. We had we went into the House of Commons and we got all the MPs to put down little stickers on how they thought their air pollution was in different areas. And actually, it was quite surprising that in some places they didn't think it was as bad as it was. And actually, it was a lot it was a lot worse because of some of these hot spots. So, I think if we can get that information out, and we can, if we can get the public to actually have a consistent um, place where they can get information for their area, it will really help this debate and help possibly detoxify it and make it a more positive one. Mm, yeah, that's really interesting. Right, I think we'll go to questions in the audience. Um, one of my colleagues has got yes. Um, do you want to go here first? I will do a couple, and we'll I'll try and pose them all at the same time. Great, thank you very much. I, I want to, I guess, ask about the political will about this and some solutions that particularly Matt outlined as, as potentially things that could be delivered long term. As David said, I'm a councillor and the leader of the Conservatives on the council next to David's constituency. But previously, I was the leader of the Conservatives on Camden Council, Keir Starmer's constituency. And they actually wrote a paper on how street trees, coming back to what Emma said, they wrote a paper on how street trees increase air pollution in the local area and they need fewer trees, not more. Now, the problem with that argument, other than it being BS, is fundamentally we're looking at these issues in isolation. If you're going to have a market trading scheme that prices in the externalities and the costs, you need to be able to have trading across different sectors. It might be that the best way to reduce air pollution in an area is through trees rather than limiting cars. It might be it's by moving away from gas boilers or industrial emissions, which account for half of PM10 and PM2.5 in London. But fundamentally, you need to have those markets operating across sectors, not just within it. But that is a much, much broader conversation. So if we are going to adopt Matt's sort of sol solutions as to having market-based concerted approaches, do we have the political appetite to do it? Oh, and do you want to go just there? Sorry, Tyler. Just there. 
Can I ask the panel how important it is that we all have a shared understanding of the science driving poor air quality? So that's some level of understanding for the public in general, but perhaps more so for, for policy makers. And I'll, I'll give you some context for that. I live in Wales, which many of you will know has a, a blanket 20 mile an hour speed ban. Now, they've sold the 20 mile an hour policy and also their policy of not building roads partly on the basis of improved air quality. But of course, the reality is that when you suddenly slow down, it means that your three-way catalyst on your car doesn't work properly, and you end up with a big knock spike. So actually, what they've done is completely counterproductive. Likewise, their policy of not building new roads has led to increased congestion. And indeed, when your catalyst isn't fully warmed up, it's unable to reduce the knocks. So what I'm I just... I guess I, I'm, it's more of a plea, but it's also a question of how can we increase the general level of understanding of the science that underpins this. If you take examples of, of particulates as well, and I think the previous speaker also indicated that you know, traffic actually can be quite a, a small uh, fraction of PN10s. I live rurally, and um, actually um, uh, solid wood burners are a massive contribution towards poor air quality. And again, I think that there's some level of understanding of this, but, it, but it's often, if you see discussions around particulates, you always see a car exhaust, but it's often the wood burner. Yeah. And one last one just there. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm, a, I'm an environmental health practitioner, so I've got a, a bit of a professional interest in this as well. And what I'm hearing from the panel and from the questions in the is a repeat of what we were saying 70 years ago um, after the, the great smog of London. And, but the debate there was about high sulphur coal and how could we desulphurize the, the, the coal. So I'd be interested in the, the first instance, is, has, has any lessons learned from the tortuous battle that there was to desulphurize uh, coal back then? Now, of course, we're decarbonizing. It's the same principles, but they had the same challenges. And what didn't work back then was um, allowing people to pollute the air by charging them £12.50 a day. But the, there's a second uh, arm to my question, is, and, and the gentleman just now touched on it, is that the, when you're tackling local pollution um, and uh, you're, you're tackling things like particulates, NOx and all the rest of it, you could be inadvertently increasing global pollution because the more efficiently things burn, the more CO2 they, they pump into the air. And just as a, um, to give some context, with the ULES in London, you can get rid of your polluting diesel car um, and replace it with a three-litre diesel Range Rover that produces three times as much CO2. So I, it's just those thoughts. Have the lessons been learned from 1953? And do we also consider global pollution um, as a, a, impacted by local pollution? Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to um, David about the political will question and are we looking at solutions in isolation? So I a really good question, Oliver, and I think that last point was really helpful in this as well. I think partly the political will is about implementing the policies, right? More importantly, there needs to be the political will to understand the problem correctly in the first place. And we know, for example, on carbon, that that is a global issue. And since 1990, we've seen a 68% per capita reduction in carbon emissions for people in the UK. So we have massively decarbonized our economy and our lifestyles in this country. Over that same period, the United States has remained flat in per capita carbon emissions, and China's increased something like 500%. Now, the issue that then throws up is that probably what we've done is we've stopped doing those carbon emitting things here in the UK, and they're now being done in China or the US or somewhere else. So the global effect has not been a reduction in carbon emissions, even though the UK has done an amazing job. So I think firstly, we, we've got to get our heads around how we do those things in partnership with other people. And then we move on to that question, is there the political will to understand the local point? I think sulphur, really good example. I grew up in the South Wales Valleys. The coal board used to give everybody a bag of free coal to heat their homes with. The desulphurization really helped to reduce smog and lung disease at a very localized level. And we need a similar kind of debate around things like transport in London, where I'm a member of parliament, there are more particulates in the air on the tube than there are at street level. And yet we're having a ULES at street level and we're not doing anything effective about what's happening underground. We know that air pollution in the capital, as recorded, is usually worse indoors than it is outdoors. And particularly low income households are affected because indoor emissions from heating, cooking and laundry 
are amongst the major reasons why children are ending up with asthma and other problems in hospital. It's not vehicle pollution outside, it's what's going on in the domestic context. So we need to be making sure that the policies that we bring forward reflect that political will to say, we're not going to, to fall into that fallacy of something must be done about this, and this is something, therefore that's what we must do. We must be implementing things that actually make the difference. And it's been really telling for me, my local air quality monitoring station is a place called South Ryslip. If we compare the 10 days following the introduction of the ULES with the same 10 day period last year, there's been a 55% increase in emissions as recorded. So I can't even look people in the eye and say, I know you don't like paying it, but this has actually made your air quality better because your air quality has got worse since the ULES was implemented. That's a really interesting thing. I think one of the, I'm going to go to the third question about the lessons learned from the 1952 smog and what didn't work. I'm going to go to you, Henry, on this. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, I'll pick up both those questions, actually. I think it's, it's a, I mean, one of the, when, when I was talking about the invisible nature of current air pollution, one of the things about the great smog was that people could actually see it and it would, you, you used to build up you know, on your on your window sills or whatever, so it was really visible, and that's something we don't have at the moment, which makes it that much harder to 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 sell. But I think I think it I think it is worth looking at these things in the round. You know, driving slowly is not a a, 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 a replacement for actually getting onto cleaner modes of transport. And equally, if you take something like wood burning, it's actually the fastest growing contributor. Um, but I, again, I think you've got to be careful. With how you address something i mean even more so i would say than, than some of the the car policies and try and work with the community to explain the dangers of wood burning and the impacts because actually the biggest impact on, in wood burning is the people in the in the home themselves um in a similar way to to what you were saying about air, indoor air pollution so so i think it is really important to not just focus on individual bits which might have a counterproductive uh, impact elsewhere, but you've got to look at it in the round and try and do as much as you can across the whole piece, indoor and outdoor, to reduce the pollutants. Yeah. I'm going to pose the third, the, the second question, but thirdly, to Imo on the shared. Um, do we need a better shared understanding of um, of air pollution problem, or do we just need a better sort of uh, shared understanding of the solutions? Um, I think you can guess what my answer is going to be. I mean, you need some public understanding because we do need to raise demand for action on air pollution, but we don't need every member of the public to have a PhD in air pollution. I've been working on air pollution now for four years, and it is incredibly complicated as a subject. There are multiple different pollutants. They interact with each other. They form further pollutants. If one pollutant goes up, it reduces other pollutants and vice versa. It's so complicated, the science around it. The scientists are arguing about it day in, day out. Um, I mean, the basic facts are understood. Don't worry, I'm not just saying that there's um, uncertainty about the health impacts of air pollution. But it, it, uh, we, so I think there's a limit to how much the public needs to be uh, fully kind of over the detail of air pollution. I think what is really important is that people understand the benefits of having cleaner air and that those benefits are sold in in ways that are meaningful to the audience. So you don't focus just on things that are, obviously there are going to be health benefits, but a lot of the public don't wake up in the morning and worry about the health impacts of air pollution. Um, but they do think, I would like my park to be nicer and I would like my home to be warmer and I'd like my bills to be lower and I would like my streets to be less congested and cleaner. And if we can link air pollution to those concerns and deliver policies that make their local areas better and also improve air quality, then we're on to a winner. Um, I'm going to go to some more questions in the audience. Um, I'm going to go for the gentleman in the green seat. Just there. Thanks. Thanks. Richard Clare, Leader of Wiltshire Council. I, I wanted to ask about the, the sort of collective impact here. In Wiltshire, uh, almost all of my exceedance zones are now below exceedance target. That's simply because cars have got more efficient. There's nothing we can actually do to stop, to, to deal with them because of the nature of those zones. However, the one that's bucked the trend is in Westbury, which has been caused by the Bath Clean Air Zone, which has stopped heavy lorries going across Cleveland Bridge, mostly due to weight. They haven't stopped diesel pollution vehicles at all. They haven't charged them at all. But we are seeing an uplift in Westbury, which is heavily canyoned, and to be blunt, a much more poorer community than affluent Bath, which is moving its problem out. DFT basically say nothing we can do. National Highways say it's a, 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 a trunk, a, a trunk road, um, and because we haven't got the legal compulsion to act, because it's not at the high levels Bath had yet, hope it doesn't get there, we can't act. 
you've, you've had the same with, with you, Les, about the impact, the, the unintended consequences. How do we make this something that's going to actually work across the board, rather than something that is uh, setting communities against each other and winding people up? Thank you. And another question. There's a lady just here. Um, I think language is really important and thinking about the Prime Minister's recent rhetoric about the war on motorists, what panel, what role do the panel think that the Conservative Party has in stopping misinformation and conspiracies about 15 minute cities, which some people on the panel have already mentioned, and the EULAs like we saw around the Uxbridge by-election. And one last one, um, there's a gentleman just next to you, Tara. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lee Chamberlain. I'm a local councillor in the London Borough of Enfield. I was one of eight new councillors who was elected on a platform which included removing the LTNs, my ward neighbours on two. Um, I'd like the panel's opinion on what the use of LTNs is, and certainly in an outer London environment. Uh, we've certainly seen a lot of increases in congestion and pollution on the boundary roads although as our local council employs uh, former cyclist lobbyists as their people, they don't, oh, the stats don't seem to reflect it. Um, I think we will go to Matt about stopping the misinformation around air quality question, if that's okay. Uh, can I answer the other ones first and then go to that? Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's more, I mean, I, I think the link between uh, the first question and the third question is the kind of like inconsistent application of various environmental policies for um, relatively minor benefits. I mean, the solution to that indeed is a road pricing system that consistently prices everything rather than saying you can't do this here and you can't do that there and then it pushes things into other places. If you had a more consistent system of taking into account people's both congestion and environmental cost, you wouldn't end up with things like 15 minute cities or LTNs or ULEs or any of these are kind of like fiddly policies that seem to have so many inconsistencies and unintended consequences. Um, which then kind of links to the other question, which is, you know, accepting that um, like a lot of these other policies, it, it's politically very challenging. So what, I mean, what can you do about dealing with, with dealing with the misinformation around it? I mean, to some extent, there are going to be conspiracy theorists and there are going to be people who um, oppose these policies um, and you're not going to be able to do anything about the, the particularly crazy end of things. I think in the more reasonable end, it goes back to that point I was making earlier, which is um, admit the trade-offs um, and admit the, you know, don't don't try to be fool people with just purely positive rhetoric at times. I think sometimes you just need to be honest with people um, if there are costs involved with the policy, what those costs are, and then you're less likely to get people being like, they're hiding the cost from me, which is then what drives the conspiracies. That's really interesting. I'm going to go to you, Emma, about the use of LTNs and traffic um, and, and impacts on traffic. And I think that one of the things that um, you, uh, Matt said was talking about admitting the trade-offs. Um, what, uh, you know, what role do you think LTNs have in communities and stuff like that? Well, low traffic neighbourhoods, basically you're not really addressing the problem. What you're doing is just shifting it from one street to the other, which could cause more of an issue actually because you now have got you've now got back-to-back uh, -back traffic so you end up with inequalities one area is got beautiful clean air and the other one hasn't the problem with air though is it doesn't know not to move um so i don't know what the solution that well i don't know what that is trying to solve it's it's i think what we have to do is go, going back to what i said originally is you need to have some, um solutions which are effective affordable and safe and reliable so we are looking at actually giving options to people, not taking away options. Um, the one thing I saw when I was walking up here was the, the, the bikes you can hire. In Redditch, we had um, a trial on e-scooters. Some people hated them, but what you could see from the stats is they were really effective. It, within the first nine months, we had 31,000 miles being, being um, traveled just on these electric scooters. That's giving choice to people. And we are conservatives, so we believe in giving people choice. We believe that intrinsically people are good and they want to choose the right thing. So we have to enable them, not lecture them. Uh, that's a really interesting way of putting things at the end. Um, I suppose um, the last question I have to, to you, David, is actually, um, is 
how, you know, we were talking a little bit about, spoken a little bit about me looking at things in isolation. I think I've asked you this question before, but uh, are it, how how can we kind of look at sort of more of a collective impact of things? Like, how can we kind of think about that we all breathe the same air? Sorry, that's not a very clear question. I think the, the question that was posed about misinformation and, and how we deal with that is really helpful because sometimes it is useful to take some of this out of, of politics. I think the ULES debate was a really good one. You know, you've got a technical report that's come out from consultants. They're not there to make a political judgment about the policy. The only question is, does this work? And their report says this will have little or no impact on air quality in outer London. That's what the report says. And yet we proceeded with a policy on the basis. Now, for me as a Conservative, that does not sound like a wise policy. And similarly, with things like 15-minute cities, I think they're brilliant. And if you're a planner, and there are plenty of people in local authorities here who may be thinking about new towns, new communities, who will say, let us build that community with a school and a pub and a shop and a doctor's surgery in it, so it will work as a 15-minute city. But imposing it on something that is a medieval city, where it's schools, it's shops, it's medical facilities, it's work locations are in the suburbs or some distance away, simply isn't going to work. And I think that's where we need to move into that situation of saying, we need to enable solutions that reflect the circumstances that we're actually facing. And too often, you know, it seems to me, we've adopted ideas. Uh, I think when I was first elected as a councillor 25 years ago, we had the, the bus stop build-outs, which some people will remember. Buses used to pull in off the main road into a, a bay, pick up the passengers and then rejoin the traffic. And then Mayor of London came along and said, no, we're going to build the bus stop out. So the bus stops all the traffic on the main road. And that was a good example. It creates congestion, increases pollution, hits productivity, wastes everybody's time. And I think we need to be able to look at some of those things and say, actually, we should have learned from those. They haven't worked. They made people's lives miserable. They've helped to reduce the UK's productivity of a country as a country, and they've increased pollution. So let's look at how we have a different approach. And that's right. What the Prime Minister said was absolutely spot on when he, he talked about we need a different approach, not things that can feel. And if you're a driver, which is most households in the UK, you need to take their kids to school and go to work, it can feel like the government is waging a war on you. Your costs are rising, it's difficult to get where you need to go, it reduces your productivity at work, and into a place where we say, how can we enable people to benefit from the liberty and the autonomy that access to affordable private transport gives them in a way that also protects and enhances our environment? And that is the question that we should be addressing. Thank you. I'm going to do one last set of questions before the end of the panel, but just a reminder to keep them as questions rather than statements. Um, the man with the glasses, just there. Thank you. Hi, yeah, Andy Makovic, uh, Cabinet Member for Climate Change and Planning in Sully Hull. And air quality is in my brief. Quickly, we had a hot spot in Sully Hull. It was a field where there was no receptors, and the DFT offered us loads of money to deal with it and impose a congestion zone, which would displace traffic. I just moved the footpath, end of, prog end of story. That was the mentality. And I've come to the conclusion that all the levers I've got are not going to work. It's down to individual choice. I remember 50 years ago, a family party would be smoke-filled rooms. Nowadays, uh, there's only about once or two smokers. They'll smoke outside. It's a, it's a change of attitude. You don't pollute people's houses. And I think we need to just address log burn. people log burn. Why are you log burning? Why are you idling outside of school? Why aren't you walking to school? And if we need to call out people and say, actually, you're bad. You're hurting people. And that's the thing. That's the only way we're going to shift this, because all the policy levers are going to hit innocent people who can't afford these policies. We just need to say, you're, and what, what the panel think about calling out people. Oh, there's a man there with his hand up. I'm Billy James. I'm a member of the London Cycling Campaign. I'm also a motorist and my family have asthma problems. The elephant in the room is this. We could all cycle to work if we live within five or seven miles of our work, but most employers don't provide changing facilities. Isn't that the centre of the problem? And just this lady here. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nikita Sinclair. I work for an organisation called Impact on Urban Health. We're part of Guys and St Thomas's Foundation. And we have a 10-year programme looking at the health effects of air pollution. And I guess one of the main things that we've learned is the importance of centering the voice and experience of people most impacted by the problem. And I've heard a lot of talk about 
um, rightly so, the people that might be impacted by policies, but interested in the panel's thoughts about how national and local government can centre those impacted by air pollution in their decisions and design and policy solutions. Um, shall we cover um, individual choice, um, Matt? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think that undoubtedly is a role for social norms in terms of um, behaviour that impacts on third parties. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, the, the biggest story here in some respects is not just kind of I get, I suppose, changing social norms and expectations, but going back to that point earlier about the Great Smog is just a story about environmental progress. I mean, we should remember that our um, air is cleaner than it was uh, in probably any, almost any time since the Industrial Revolution, I would think. Um, our same story with our rivers and our streams. Um, and a lot of that is, is despite the fact that we are a bigger population, we're using technology more, we're consuming more energy, et cetera, et cetera. But we've found technological solutions that have enabled us to do that all without having as negative an environmental impact. So kind of focusing in on you know, what, what are ways to reduce our footprint by embracing that innovation is also, I think, a, a key part of the story here. Um, um, thank you. Um, and I'm going to go to you, Emma, and ask you about what you think about having people more involved in the sort of national and local policy picture. Yeah, so, so when I was talking earlier about um, engaging with people, uh, that absolutely includes people who are impacted um, by air pollution. I mean, my, my husband um, comes from Birmingham, and when he was in Birmingham, he had terrible asthma. He's moved to Redditch. We have got cleaner air. Uh, it's, it's no way it's going to be perfect, but it's a lot cleaner. His asthma has got a lot better. So we can see that there is a difference in where you live. Um, that's not to say that we need to get everyone to move because nothing would be uh, solved. But making sure that your your voice or, and you know, um, you, we've, we've got Henry here today and he's able to then speak on behalf of people who can't be here. But yes, absolutely, we need to make sure that your voice is in the room. You've got a seat at the table because how are we going to learn if we don't actually take everybody into consideration? We can't, we can't demonise drivers, but we can't then just ignore the problem and think it'll go away because we have to get a solution for the people who are suffering, absolutely. And really quickly, I'm just going to come to you, Henry, about changing rooms in the workplace. And I'm going to kind of pose the question is, do you think that we sometimes make things like cycling too difficult for people to easily adopt? Definitely. And I, and I think one of the points I was going to make about actually the last set of questions and this set is that we've talked in this discussion a lot about, I think Imo said, the sticks and the difficulty of those kind of policies. And obviously, you can see why they, you focus on those because they raise money. But actually, if you think about some of the carrots that you could introduce to get people on those e-scooters, even if not everyone likes them, some people do. You know, the e-bikes. You know, or, or do you, or do you you know allow or encourage organisations to actually fit facilities for people to cycle? All of these things could potentially create jobs. They're, they're going to improve the air quality. But most importantly, they give people options, which is what David was just talking about. And I think if you give people options, that makes it then easier to have a conversation with them about do they want to do things differently? And actually, could they do things in a way that will improve their health and improve the health of the people in their communities? And it makes a much richer and more beneficial conversation. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask the panelists to do a quick 30 second final remark. So I'm going to go to you first, Imo. Um, about your one thing that you would like to happen around the air quality debate following uh, the, 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 the conversation we've been having in the, la in the last hour. Uh, I haven't got a timer, so you'll have to tell me when to stop. Yeah. Um, I would really hope that the conversations that we've been having nationally about air pollution don't put politicians and decision makers off from thinking about genuine solutions to tackling air quality. And I think that there are some really fabulous new ideas out there for how we can reduce air pollution and please let's have a conversation about those rather than just keeping the conversation on one or two policies that have become quite controversial. Yeah. And David? So I think for a start we're in a much better place in the debate about air quality than we've been for a long time. We're beginning to see political parties including ours talking in a really practical way about the difference we're going to make. I said I was really struck by the point about showers at work and cycling because I think in a way that's a good microcosm of one of the challenges with this debate, 70% of people who are employed in this country 
are in an enterprise with less than five staff. And I know if we say, let's encourage everyone to cycle as a solution, let's get showers at work, the FTSE 100 will do it, but almost nobody amongst our working population will benefit from that. And that's where it's not a bad thing, but we need to be saying those things can be seen as quite tokenistic. We need to be strategic about this, and we need to be setting an agenda that says the policies that we implement are the ones that bring about that long-term reduction in air pollution, the long-term improvement in air quality in a way that is measurable and works for people, as opposed to picking and choosing the things that politically might be convenient, but which maybe do not deliver that strategic objective. And Matt? Uh, I mean, just to reiterate everything I've just said, I think we can be optimistic and positive about opportunities here uh, to improve the environmental impact um, and also pursue policies that are both good for the environment and good for motorists um, and that we don't necessarily have to be at war with each other. Henry? Um, yeah, so just, just reinforcing what I said before, we would be in favour of a clean air transport access fund to give people more options to help them to switch uh, because ultimately a lot of them want, want to do the right thing and actually want to live in a cleaner and more healthy way. So let's, let's incentivise them and let's support them to do so. And finally, Emma. Thank you. Uh, I'd like for us to consider when we're looking at solutions about the time elements. I mean, Matthew picked up on this. Um, people are very, very busy. And if you're saying to somebody, we want you to walk, we want you to go on the bike, but you've got a mom who's got to get three kids to three different schools and straight on to work, you have to solve that problem and then you can solve the air quality issue. So some of it is, is the fact that we are very, very busy people and our lives have changed. So it's not, it's not how it used to be that the man just goes out to work on a nine to five and the woman's at home we, we all we're all we're all doing so much and you answer that problem and that's a societal um a societal, societal issue and that's a culture issue and then we can get on to how we actually solve the problem thank you Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that discussion. Um, I'm, I should point out that the Sen has a stand in the exhibition zone. We can hear more about all of our campaigns. We've got an exciting program on of lots of other events as well, but we're running a wildflower campaign today. So if you pop over to the Sen stand, you can hear more about that too. And thank you very much for coming. <laughs>